Where does the fish fork go? A look at sterling silver flatware. Thank you for viewing this presentation on Where Does the Fish Fork Go? A look at sterling silver flatware. I chose the title because the fish fork is one of the more unusual pieces of sterling flatware I have come across, although I will be showing you a number of others. The idea for this presentation arose when the Victorian House Council, of which I am a member, was discussing ideas for smaller exhibits known as cabinets of curiosity and presentations that would complement the Historical Society's main exhibit for 2023. Everybody ought to have a maid, servants in Cedar Falls. At the close of this presentation, you will find information on the patterns of the pieces that you will be seeing, as well as a select guide to internet resources. Hi, I'm Kate Martin, a volunteer at the Cedar Falls Historical Society. This first image provides a template for a place setting for a formal dinner. I've also created a sample of a formal setting that includes pieces from my personal collection. In the event you are interested, I'll note that the sterling flatware is the Georgian rose pattern by Reed and Barton, introduced in 1941, the China, the Edmonton pattern, marketed by Syracuse, and the crystal, the intrigue pattern from Lennox. In using the place setting, you work your way in from the outside. Each piece's purpose and the courses in a meal determines the layout. The only fork placed on the right side of the place setting would be an oyster or seafood fork, which would be the first fork you would use in eating an appetizer. Glasses are placed on the right above the knives and spoon. They can number up to five and are placed in the order they will be used. When there are more than three glasses, they can be arranged with smaller glasses in front. There are five types of place settings. Formal, for five courses, soup, salad, fish course, main course, and dessert. Informal, which includes a knife, fork, soup spoon, and a cloth napkin. Basic, which includes a knife, fork, casual china, and a paper napkin buffet, and five course, which mimics the formal place setting. There also is provision for a six course meal, which usually includes appetizers, soup, a palate cleanser, such as sorbet, an entree, salad, and dessert. There are three sizes of flatware, which can be distinguished by the length of the fork and the knife. The continental, or the formal, is the most common. Then there is a place setting, and a luncheon setting. Again, shorter handles on the knife and the fork. The earliest known piece of American marked silver dates from 1651. This was a silver bowl. Initially, there was no centralized assay or marking system in the United States, but federal standards were adopted in the late 19th and early 20th century. One way to identify sterling and its manufacturer is through the maker's mark that appears on the verso of the stem. Here you see images from some well-known manufacturers. Note that company names and marks may change over time. You may also see the word sterling, as shown here, on the back of a particular stem. What you see here is an individual place setting. The five piece is the standard place setting. This is a photograph of a place setting known as Buttercup, an older Gorham pattern, first introduced in 1899. There are various lists on the internet of the most popular sterling flatware patterns. 
The photograph here is of Grand Baroque flatware, frequently number one on lists of popular patterns. Made by Wallace, it was first introduced in 1941. The ornate Victorian design reportedly took four years to develop. Note that you may find identical patterns under different trademarks. Patented patterns and dyes were sold by one manufacturer to another. The fish fork and knife first gained popularity in the 1800s and peaked during the Victorian era around 1850. Fine dining within this period usually included a soup course, a fish course, and a meat course, with each requiring different cutlery sets of specialized flatware. This assortment of utensils helped to distinguish the serving and eating of various food types. A standard fish fork is more petite than a regular table fork, yet larger than a salad fork. Typically, fish forks have a curved shaped form, which help to differentiate them from other utensils on the table at a traditional Victorian dinner party. The strong flavor and aroma of fish may have contributed to this specialization. A fish knife and fork have a wide range of uses and benefits. The knife's sharp point is excellent at cutting through the fish's skin, while its wide, flat spatula blade makes it easy to separate the skin from the flesh. You can use a fish knife to simplify skin removal, then turn it and use the blade to lift the meat from the bones onto the fork. In addition to helping separate the fish from its skin, the fish knife's broad blade can assist with lifting the fish to the fork while keeping all the flakes in one piece. Proper fish knife and fork etiquette keeps the fish intact from the knife to the fork. The fish knife's generally wide surface also assists in spreading any sauce served alongside the fish. Another unusual piece is the five o'clock teaspoon. These pieces, shown here, are silver plate that come from the Cedar Falls Historical Society collection. The typical five o'clock spoon is five and a quarter to five and a half inches in length. I will note that I have seen many images that have a rounded rather than a pointed bowl. This is a spoon reserved for an afternoon formal coffee or tea, hence the name. The pointed tip may be used to skim the surface of the tea to remove if any floating solids. I now turn my attention to the variety of serving pieces that were used in the Victorian era and early 20th century. Serving pieces can have multiple purposes. There were hundreds in the Victorian era, what I have seen characterized as the cutlery overkill of that era. This was a period when the rising middle class, or nouveau riche, sought to mimic the practices and possessions of the wealthy and the aristocratic. Many new pieces were introduced in the 19th century. These included sugar shells and pickle forks and spoons. Serving pieces did not always match the silver in the place setting, but often had ornate designs. Here we see a salad set. Larger sets, often with that shaped full bowl on the spoon, were used to serve meat and vegetables at the table. Here we see a gravy ladle from the Victorian period. You'll note that the stem is very detailed and decorative. This was typical of the period. This is a variety of pickle forks used at the table. Here are some miscellaneous small serving spoons. The one at the bottom is a mustard spoon. Here you see a sugar spoon on the left and a sugar shell on the right. The sugar shells are often quite ornate. The main course provided occasion for a variety of specialized serving pieces, as you will see. This is a tomato server. The pierced design allowed for juices to be captured on the serving platter rather than conveyed to the individual dinner plate. Here we have a bacon fork. Similar in design is this sardine fork. This is a jelly server. Although not obvious in this image, it has a curvature to the bowl which captures the food that it's intending to serve. 
It often resembles a curved leaf, and it can be used for aspic and cranberry sauce, as well as various jellies. These pieces also can be used to serve cakes and pies. The lemon fork was designed for the purpose of serving wedges of lemon at the table. They are most commonly set out at formal tea parties. The fork has three tines, a straight central tine, and two splayed side tines to help hold the lemon in place. Asparagus tongs and servers are among the most ornate and beautiful of the serving pieces used during the main course. They were designed as flat pieces to prevent the asparagus spears from sliding off a serving fork and also to avoid crushing the delicate stems. Do you know what these are? They're bread forks used for serving bread from a bread basket or bread tray. Touching food while it was being served was considered improper by the Victorians, although it was permissible once the bread was at an individual place setting. Once served, the bread was not cut, but torn into small pieces, then buttered. Simpler designs were developed for use in more modest households. Many of these had ivory or wooden handles. Here is a quote from a mid-19th century volume that explains how to properly serve and eat bread at the dinner table. The dessert course also lent itself to a proliferation of ornate and very specialized serving pieces. Grape scissors were introduced in the late 1700s. The handles are quite often very ornate and decorated with vines and other foliage. The scissors were used to cut the stems of a bunch of grapes. Although made in the general form of a pair of scissors, they had two wide, flat-faced blades, only one of which had a cutting edge. The pair here are in the fox and grapes pattern. The scissors made a social statement, but also had a practical purpose, in that cutting rather than pulling the grapes off manually, preserve the longevity of the fruit. The cheese scoop was used to serve soft cheeses, such as a Stilton and a Brie. The cracker server, while a lovely piece as seen here, lacks something in practicality. How did the crackers not slide off the bowl? The claret spoon was used in the late 19th century and early 20th century to remove marinated fruit from the bottom of a tall cut glass pitcher and then place it, the fruit on individual plates for consumption. The ice cream fork has a shallow bowl and three tines at the end. It resembles a contemporary fork-spoon combination known as a spork. It was used instead of a spoon to consume firm ice cream that was presented on a plate. If the ice cream was served in a bowl, then a spoon was used. This blackberry spoon, like other berry servers, has a design that reflects the fruit it was intended to serve. The bonbon server, bonbon is the French word for candy, was designed to be passed around from person to person at a party or social gathering. Sometimes these servers had ornate designs specifically intended for the occasion, such as a wedding or a funeral. This cake server in the repoussé pattern is a recent addition to the Historical Society collection. It is an unusual piece in that it has heavy ornamentation and a very raised design. Repoussé is a term that comes from the French, meaning pushed back. It refers to any type of ornamentation in which the design is raised in relief on the reverse or interior side of the metal piece. The word's first known use was in the early 1800s as silversmiths in America embraced the method. The Repoussé is the oldest sterling silver pattern produced in the United States. It dates from 1828. Silversmiths nationwide used the technique, but Baltimore was where it was most common. The silversmiths there created a regional style that featured masses of repoussé flowers. Pieces in silver 
and silver plate also were made for the exclusive use of children and youth. Many of the designs featured nursery rhyme themes or other specialized children-oriented images. Do you know what these pieces were used for? These are food pushers, which were flat rectangles of metal attached at a 90 degree angle to a handle. Children were discouraged from using their fingers to eat, and so they used the pusher to move the food from a plate onto a fork or spoon. You may have silver at home and be wondering whether it's sterling or silver plate. How can you tell the composition of a piece? Sterling silver is lighter than silver plate, which is made heavier by its base metal, which is often brass. Silver plate generally is lighter in color than sterling, and silver is less shiny than silver plate. Making a determination based on these factors may require you to have a variety of pieces for comparison purposes. If you do not see a sterling maker's mark on the back of your spoon or fork, the item is probably silver plate. And if a magnet sticks to the piece, it is not sterling silver. I'd like to close with a few remarks about the care of sterling silver and silver plate. Sterling should be stored in silver cloth. Some people use plastic wrap or bags, but be aware that it can and will tarnish if there's any exposure to air. The sulfur content in the plastic also will accelerate tarnishing. You should not put sterling or silver plate in the dishwasher, but if you do, remove it before the heat cycle begins. Before you use a dishwasher, wash your sterling or silver plate by hand the first four or five times. This presents the minuscule amount of copper from forming brown spots on your sterling. Promptly rinse all excess food off of the silverware and do not let sterling or stainless pieces touch. In an oxidation reduction reaction, the silver ions are converted into solid silver that gets deposited on the stainless steel, causing a reaction of corrosion. Avoid lemon scented detergents, those containing chlorides, and always use slightly less than recommended. When hand washing your sterling, dry it promptly and thoroughly and finish up with air drying. You're going to want to count it anyway. Let it cool before putting it away. Thank you for your interest, your time, and your attention. Following this slide are several that can be used to identify the patterns and the manufacturers of the sterling pieces you have seen here today. I also have included a brief list of internet resources that you might find of use in attempting to identify silver that you may have. Thank you again.